Hello and welcome. I'm Daughter of Darkness, your narrator. One of the most frightening things in life is delving into the twisted mind of serial killers, murderers, and abusers of all kinds. These are the stories we'll be dealing with tonight, and they're sure to leave you feeling slightly off balance. But I'll walk with you the entire way. Lean on me, and we'll make it through to the other side together. Be sure to join me here every Thursday at 5 p.m. Central for new stories to be told in the dark by me. So for now, sit back, relax, let me lead the way, and let's get scared together, 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 together. So, I've been wanting to write about this encounter for a while now. Unfortunately, it's taken me a long time to even fully fathom and process the danger I was in the evening this story takes place. This occurred just shy of one year ago. For background, I'm a 22-year-old female who was attending university in a large city three hours outside of my hometown. I was living alone at the time, and my closest relatives were hours away from me. I had just recently gotten out of an abusive relationship, and honestly, I was extremely heartbroken and devastated. I had been living in a small one-bedroom apartment with said boyfriend for the past two years. After the end of our relationship, he moved out, and I remained residing in the apartment alone. I'm only mentioning that detail because in some real way, it played into the reckless decisions I made that evening. It was hard for me to go home to that empty apartment. It amplified and worsened the heartbreak that I was feeling at the time. My friends decided to take me to a hockey game to get me out of the house and potentially take my mind off the breakup. It was a Friday night, and we had been consuming a fair amount of alcohol during the hockey game. Attached to that arena, there was also a casino. So, following the game, we decided to head there for a few more drinks. It was a busy night and the line for the bar was long. As I patiently waited for service, I began to speak to a group of men and foolishly exchanged numbers with one of them. My friends and I decided to call it a night due to the overwhelming amount of people crowding the area. We parted ways, but instead of going home, I spontaneously and quite drunkenly decided to text the man from the casino bar he responded right away, informing me that he and his friends had gone to a nightclub in the area and he invited me to join them. I still regret almost every choice I made that evening, but I booked an Uber and went to meet him. The night from then on consisted of large amounts of alcohol and dancing. Now, as mentioned earlier, my judgment was severely lacking due to both intoxication and the impulsiveness I was feeling. All of this was an attempt to numb the pain of the breakup. I never had a one night stand before, so I decided to go home with the man that I had been chatting to and dancing with all evening. We arrived at his residence via an Uber that he booked himself. His house was uncannily clean. Think hospital level clean, right down to the smell of cleaning solution. Without even offering, he poured us each a glass of seemingly expensive red wine. I thought nothing of it at the time, because he had poured it right in front of me, so I drank it. That is the last memory that I have prior to waking up in his bedroom due to the noise of the running shower. I was groggy and dazed when I woke up, but slowly I began to recollect where I was, who I was with, etc., I began to panic when I realized that the only article of clothing still on my body was my bra. I frantically began searching for my cell phone, clothes, and wallet. I rushed out of the bedroom, hoping to leave unnoticed while he was still in the shower. As I left the bedroom, my heart stopped. All of his furniture and the floors were completely covered with plastic shower curtains which I distinctly remember not being there prior to my blacking out. Worse yet, 
all of my personal belongings were placed neatly on the kitchen counter alongside a hammer. My instincts kicked into high gear and I grabbed my things and I ran out the door, not even bothering to put my clothes on first. Once I was out of the house, I ran for several minutes in a random direction, panicked and adrenaline fueled, putting my clothes on as I ran. Once I finally stopped, I called a cab and went back to my apartment, not speaking about this incident to anyone for a long time to come. The detail that haunts me the most is that the one thing that was missing from my personal belongings was my ID. What were his intentions? Did he take my ID as a trophy or memento for what he had planned to do to me that evening? What was in the wine that made it knock me out the way it did? Looking back on it, I realized I should have contacted the authorities immediately. Perhaps the reason for both, me not speaking to law enforcement and me not telling my friends and family about the horrors that I witnessed that evening, was because I was, and still am, deeply ashamed of the impulsiveness and naivete with which I acted that night. This eats away at me daily because I believe it is potentially too late to report this man, seeing as I don't even have the slightest recollection of where his house was located or know his real name. I did try calling the number he was texting me from, but it's no longer in service. Also, I am positive that I had my ID in my possession when we left the club. If anyone can give me any advice on how or if I can pursue this, I would be forever grateful. It weighs on me the constant fear that he has hurt another female prior to me or since our encounter. I was not in the right state of mind to contact the authorities any sooner. Anyway, potential rapist and serial killer, let's not meet again. This older man has lived in the corner basement unit of my girlfriend's apartment building for many years. I noticed when we'd walk down to the basement to do laundry that I could always hear loud music coming from his apartment. It was loud enough to hear in the hallway, but not loud enough to hear in your own apartment. Also, he always had sheets over the windows, even on the nicest, sunniest of days. We would always make jokes that he played loud music 24-7, because he probably had a hostage in there. Fast forward to last week. We got back from grocery shopping and noticed cop cars outside the apartment building. There was a dead body being brought out and basement guy was outside talking to the cops. A good friend lives in the unit across from him and could hear everything that was going on and what the cops had been saying. So she filled us in. It turns out he had called the cops about his girlfriend dying of COVID-19. They came to get the body and asked questions because he had supposedly moved the body from the bedroom to the living room and kept changing the time that she supposedly died. First he said she died that morning, then he said last night, but the cops said the body looked like it had been there for at least three days. We speculated that he actually called because the body started to smell and he used COVID as an excuse so that they would stay out of the apartment as much as they could. He also apparently lied about her name multiple times, and they couldn't find an ID on her. She was so severely malnourished and had such bad bed sores all over her body, the cop said she probably couldn't have walked. One cop on the scene saw a lot of unmarked pill bottles and decided to look around. That is when they found a 13-year-old girl hiding in the bedroom. She was completely mute and malnourished and was missing chunks of her hair. Basement guy never mentioned a little girl. He even went so far as to tell them that nobody else was even in the apartment. Let me make it perfectly clear. This is a very small one-bedroom apartment. He never even told the landlord that he had two people living with him. My girlfriend had also never seen or heard of these people. 
The cop also said they could find no type of ID or birth certificate for this girl, and the apartment was completely riddled with black mold and no edible food anywhere. They also found several guns. Turns out basement guy is in his 60s, and the woman that died was only 30. It also turns out that he never got arrested for this. God knows why. I'm sure they must be building a case against him. The girl got taken away, but I don't know where. Our friends said they heard the cop on the phone with CPS, and he was telling his partner that they told him, quote, well, if you're that worried about the girl, take her home yourself, unquote. We called the landlord the next day to see if she knew anything that was going on, and she told us that she was evicting him and he'd be gone in a few weeks. Over the following weeks, the music stopped, and we saw him take a large cage to the dumpster. He told the landlord that the woman died of natural causes and that COVID wasn't involved. We talked to the woman who lived upstairs from him, and she said that she actually called the police multiple times on him because for the past several months, she could hear someone's muffled screams for help. The police clearly had done nothing. But Basement Guy must have known that the neighbor had said something because after she called the cops, he left a bag of dog poop in front of her door and would scream and call her nasty names when he saw her around. It's all speculation as to what actually happened in that apartment, but it's pretty clear that there was some foul play going on there. We think that he didn't even live there full time and was just holding his hostages there. We think that he just came there whenever he wanted to get off or abuse them in some way. I've seen the man only once in passing and never spoke to him. We're completely clueless as to why he wasn't locked up or even taken in for questioning. I don't know every detail and never will, but it's been disturbing staying at my girlfriend's apartment knowing that he's sleeping in the same building. We packed up and went to my parents' house until he moves out. And here are some replies from the comments section. It's amazing what cops won't do, even when it's in their face. I was abused in every possible way by my stepdad for years, as was my brother, but to a lesser degree, because the man hated women and girls. This was done in front of neighbors, too. No one ever called the cops, not once. My mom did nothing, and I mean, it was bad. I've been shot at on more than one occasion, beaten up. He even tried to kill me with a baseball bat. He intentionally killed animals and a million other things. I could write a novel. This meant I spent every day of my life between the ages of 13 and 18, not knowing if I'd wake up the next day. Every day. There were several times that I did manage to get hold of a phone and call the cops. This was a time before cell phones. The operator would hear gunshots and screaming, or whatever was happening at the time, and they'd send the cops. However, my mom would cry and get upset, and tell me that they'd separate me and my little brother, essentially guilt-tripping me into keeping my mouth shut, or telling them everything was fine. We had nowhere to go, no family, no friends to take us in. So we were forced to hide or not answer the door when the cops did show up. Prior experience with cops definitely did not help matters either, growing up how I did. I left the very moment that I could, and thankfully, my brother found a place to go as well. But yeah, I can't tell you how frequently the cops came and did nothing. What made it even weirder was that my stepdad was a felon. We never found out the exact nature of his crimes, but it had something to do with either killing someone one-on-one -on -one or indirectly in a group situation. My mom was also a felon due to drugs. I found out much later that nearly the entire police force in that small town was involved in the same drug ring that they were in which is most likely the reason that nothing ever happened 
and they were never arrested for child abuse. So, from my own experience, the cops would be the last people I would call if I ever needed help, because they've never been anything but useless to me. A similar thing happened to me. The entire school knew that we were being abused in our home because of how skinny my sister and I were and how dirty our clothes and bodies were, since the water and power were constantly being shut off. One year, we even won a free honey-baked ham gift card in a contest that we didn't enter, nor even existed. It was around Thanksgiving time, and they wanted to make sure that we had something to eat while making us believe that it wasn't charity. I know for a fact that neighbors called CPS, but we were told that if we let them in, it would be the last thing that we'd do. One time, when I was 16, I went on a walk without telling my dad. It was during the time that he normally went to work, so I thought I could get out and get some fresh air without getting into trouble. I was gone for maybe an hour, and when I got home, about eight cops were sitting around the table with my dad, and my dad grabbed me by my arm, threw me to the ground, and started kicking the absolute crap out of me, right in front of them. One by one, the cops stood up and left our house. Not one of them even so much as made any kind of report. I know this for a fact, because when my mother finally left my father and tried for full custody, there weren't any record of reports of child abuse in that house. Some cops suck. Not all, of course, but bad apples tend to spoil the bunch. For me, anyway. This was a widely publicized case, and the trial is still ongoing, so a few details, including names, will be changed for privacy reasons. But the main part of the story is accurate. A few years ago, I worked at a popular bar in my town. We had many regulars, and among the regulars was a group of people I wasn't terribly fond of, except for one girl, Rachel. I really enjoyed talking to her, but I didn't approve of the people she hung out with or the decisions that she made. But it was her life, so who was I to say anything? Eventually, Rachel started dating Ben, someone who was part of my friend group, and this is when we got closer and she started to confide in me more. Eventually, Rachel and Ben broke up, and it devastated Rachel. I remember her asking me to hang out and crying on my shoulder about it. During her relationship with Ben, Rachel stopped hanging around those shady people that I didn't like. But of course, after the breakup, she went right back to them and started partying a lot and doing God knows what. She stopped talking to me as much and eventually started dating one of the guys from the shady group named Greg. Soon though, that relationship went south as well for reasons unknown to me and Rachel ended up filing a restraining order against Greg. A few days after she filed, Rachel went missing and was never heard from again. It was awful. Her family started showing up to talk to me, asking if I'd seen her. I hadn't. Apparently, someone had told them that Rachel had been seen downtown somewhere. The whole thing broke my heart. One day, during a very busy shift at work, Carl, a guy that she and I had known casually, showed up and asked me about Rachel's disappearance. He told me that he heard someone had seen her downtown and wanted to know what I knew about it. He even asked me if I heard if anything bad had happened to her. I assume he thought that since I worked at one of her regular hangouts that I may have heard something. I told him that I hadn't heard a thing and we hugged before he walked off to talk to other people. Months passed by before I heard anything more about Rachel. Her family showed up from time to time asking about her, but nothing changed. About a year after her disappearance, the police had a breakthrough in the case. 
and her body was found. After some investigation, the police discovered that Greg had hired Carl to kill Rachel. He killed her, hid her body, and continued on with life as usual. According to news articles, Greg and Rachel got into an argument about something, and Greg beat her up. So afterwards, Rachel went to get the restraining order, and Greg threatened to kill her if she told anybody about what he had done. A week after she filed the restraining order, she went missing. So basically, Greg had killed her so she wouldn't testify against him. She was very innocent. She just trusted the wrong people. Greg was also caught and he's in prison. The trial is still going on because there were multiple people involved. The fact that I spoke to Carl after he killed my friend and even hugged him still weighs on my conscience. It's been years, and I'm still so upset about it. He's in prison, and I'll likely never see him again, but it still hurts. I wish I had been a better friend to her. I don't blame myself for her murder, but I do wish that I could have done something. Had I been more insistent that she drop those shady friends, maybe she'd still be here. Who knows? All I do know is that if for whatever reason I ever do see Carl again, it won't be a good thing for him. He knew she was dead, and he still asked me if I had heard or seen anything about her. Carl, I hope you suffer. My ex-girlfriend's father murdered her mother. My ex was 33 at the time, and her parents had been together probably 40 years. Apparently, they were having financial problems, and their home was being foreclosed on. Well, the dad had too much pride or something, because something in him just broke. He shot his wife in the head while she slept, left his daughter a suicide note, and went fishing in the wilderness for the weekend. And at the end of that, he planned to kill himself. My ex actually still keeps in contact with him. Not a lot, but she does send him money and visit on occasion. Why, you may ask? She said she knew that act wasn't actually her dad. Her dad wasn't a cold-blooded killer. He was just a man who snapped under pressure. She said that in the months and weeks leading up to it, she could tell he was extremely stressed out. She also said that now her father dissociates, and he doesn't even really believe that he killed his wife. He's barely present in the moment. His mind is elsewhere. It's really, really scary to think about that. I think my ex struggles a lot because she can't write her father off as a horrible human being. I think that would have been easier for her. That a good man can do such a heinous thing well, that is terrifying. By the way, I read the note that he left for her. It was one of the most genuine loving things that I've ever read. This was a man who adored his daughter and hated what he was doing to her, but he couldn't help himself. I don't know exactly what happened. I never grilled my ex for answers, so I only know what she told me. And I never, not even to this day, looked up the case though I did Google it to see if it was true, and there were lots of articles on it, but I didn't read any of them. I wanted my ex to tell me what she was comfortable with me knowing, because I knew a lot of people treated her like a curiosity. I didn't want to know anything beyond what she was willing to share with me on her own, so a lot of the details I'm not super clear on. I do know that she didn't know if her father was alive or dead for two to three days during the manhunt. She didn't tell me how they knew where to look for him. I assume she gave them some ideas of where to find him because she knew all of his hangouts. They found him while he was fishing. I don't know if he left his gun in the cabin, or if he had a change of heart and decided not to kill himself, or maybe he attempted suicide and the cops got there just in the nick of time. 
I don't know, because I respected her privacy and she never wanted to share that part with me. But, yeah, they found him by the lake with the rod and reel. Fishing. So, this is my mom's story, not mine. My mom lived in Colorado Springs, Colorado for 10 plus years. It was 1994, just four days after her 20th birthday. She was working at a local Arby's a few blocks from her home, and she was working the late shift until 1 a.m. Her manager was named Missy Berry, and she was murdered for basically being hated by one of her employees. Mom had only worked there for a few weeks, so she hadn't formed an opinion yet. Missy was nice to Mom, but not to everyone. There was one employee named Cliff who hated Missy's guts. Mom said she remembered that he'd call her all kinds of names behind her back and that he loved to say that he'd end up killing her one day. The night of the murder, Missy was going to make a bank drop with a day's take, as usual. Since it was such a cold night and my mom had to walk home, Missy offered her a ride. This was before Cliff asked her for a ride, planning to kill and rob Missy. At the time, Mom thought it was really weird that Cliff would ask a ride home from someone he claimed to hate so much, but she shrugged it off. Living so close, obviously Mom's ride was pretty short. Not five minutes after Mom got dropped off, Missy and Cliff stopped at a traffic light where Cliff took out a gun and shot Missy dead and took the money. Mom didn't hear about the murder until days later when she read the newspaper. Of course it shook her to the core. She didn't need to go to the police because they had already found who had done it, otherwise she would have. The weirdest part of this for me is the fact that my grandpa on my dad's side was one of the detectives who had to deal with the case at the time. Cliff flew to England with the money that he stole, and my grandpa had to go over there and tell the British court that they wouldn't execute Cliff if they extradited him back to the United States. My mom and dad met later that same year. If you watch Homicide Hunter Season 2, Episode 6, you can see my grandpa working on the case. My mom was never once mentioned in the episode or in the case because she was in the back seat of the car and they had already concluded that the killer was in the passenger seat, so they never spoke to her. She, Cliff, and Missy are the only ones who even knew she was in the car with them that night. Granted, there are a few holes in her story, but this was 26 years ago, so obviously, Mom's memory isn't spot on. But she has absolutely no reason to lie about such a thing. Another thing that I'd like to point out is that I only found this episode of Homicide Hunter because my grandpa has been on it a few times and I wanted to watch the show. It's so weird because I was actually enjoying the episode right up until the time my mom told me this story. If Cliff hadn't decided to wait until my mom got out of the car that night, I most likely wouldn't be alive and writing this to you right now. So Cliff, I hope you never get out of jail. Just an FYI, this poster's grandfather has his own YouTube channel. There will be a link in the description below. Seriously? These so-called human beings live in the same world as you and me? And breathe the same air that we do? What happened to make them so very different from you and I? That is a question that can never truly be answered, thus making them all the more terrifying. Tell me in the comments below your theory as to why some people turn out the way they do. Psychology is an imprecise science at best, so your theory is as good as anyone else's. Be sure to join me here next Thursday at 5 p.m. Central so we can cleanse our palate with some good old-fashioned ghost stories. Let's leave the creepy people behind for now, 
and frolic in the land of the dead. It's a lot safer there. So, until next time, stay scared, my friends. <laughs>